Um, so I, I come at that question both late and uh, from a different perspective, I think, than most people who ask the question. I really, I really find the question interesting at this point um, in my career because I started my career studying the personality of adults and asking the question, do you continue to develop and change when you're 30 or 40? That was novel as opposed to the question about whether a kid develops, which is somewhat mundane. Everybody assumes children develop, and so I, I wasn't really at least at first interested in that question. We did a lot of work establishing the continuity and change in personality in adulthood, what factors were associated with change and development. And we did a few studies that demonstrated the importance of personality and actually predicted things of consequence. And at that point, uh, people started asking questions like, well, how do you end up being an 18-year-old possessing a certain level of conscientiousness or a certain level of extroversion or, or disagreeableness uh, if you're a teenager? And to be honest with you, we hadn't really thought about the, the, the question itself or the answers to the question. Uh, and so you, know, you can do a lot of different things. You go to the developmental textbooks and you read what they say. They don't say a lot. Uh, and that was one of the fascinating discoveries is that for the most part, personality development in childhood and adolescence isn't really a topic of focus for a body of researchers. So developmental scientists tend to look at other outcomes that they might consider more malleable. And so they haven't really asked the question. And that leaves you with the kind of uh, simple and somewhat deceptive work of the early behavior geneticists. Personality is heritable. So if you look at the textbooks on per the personality side of things, you know, that's the developmental story. It's like you're born, you have a personality, it's heritable, <laughs> and then you become an adult. And we found that to be somewhat lacking. Um, and so recently we've been focusing our efforts trying to figure out the question, you know, how do you become a teenager possessing certain levels of any of the traits? We've been focusing a lot on conscientiousness. And that involves, of course, looking at the the genetics literature and the heritability literature. And there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on there, which is fun. Um, so the kind of sing-song response from the behavior geneticists or the twin research is that personality is 50% heritable. If you're being uh, more modest, it's 30 to 50% heritable, depending upon whose meta-analysis and what study you're looking at. And that leaves a lot of people with the false impression that you're born with a personality, you're stuck with a personality, um, and it doesn't change. And uh, a number of findings have been coming out recently that make it a lot more interesting. First one I really like a lot, um, which is that the heritability of personality is um, not just additive genetic variants, which we kind of think of in the classic sense. If your parents have the trait, you're going to get some of it. <laughs> if you, both parents have the trait, you're going to get more of it, like height or something like that. And it, it turns out that personality is not that simple. So uh, the more recent studies have been showing that there's a lot more what's called dominance heritability. So that's the unique combination of your parents' um, DNA strands getting together and creating who you are. And that means that a significant portion of our personalities are heritable but not predictable, at least not from our parents. And I just find that entirely cool uh, because then you really can't say, well, I am this way because my parents gave me this gene. You can say, I am this way because my, both my parents gave me different sets of genes that multiply together in a way that was unpredictable. That's a lot of fun. It also explains a lot of things in the, the genetics literature that's coming out now. Um, the other thing that's happening is they're becoming much more sensitized to the fact that there's a dynamic genome and a dynamic developmental sequence of events between genes and environments in kids. So those heritability estimates usually come from teenagers, young adults, college students, and the like. And they kind of assume a bunch of things. And one of the things that they have been discovering lately is that the assumption that it's just this thing you get at conception was really inaccurate. I always like to say that the genetics literature is the best possible place to justify the interest in and pursuit of environmental reasons for why you be who you are, um, because they show definitively that at least 50% of your personality is the result of something other than genetics. And combine that with that new research, and it's going to be more than 50%, 50 to 75% of your, um, your personality is going to be the result of some type of transaction with your environment. And that makes it, of course, interesting um, to try to understand what's going on. And so we've started pursuing 
what studies we can without collecting our own data, um, studying a bunch of infants and tracking them until they're, <laughs> they're adults. And there are lots of studies out there, both prospective longitudinal studies, retrospective studies, and the like, where you can ask very simple questions like, what kind of background factors did you have and how did that contribute to who you are? And uh, I'm, I can't say I'm happy to report, I'm, I'm here to pose a mystery um, because the findings we're coming up with aren't answering the question. So we started with the simple things, birth order. It was a widely held assumption that birth order was strongly related to lots of different personality uh, attributes. So firstborns are supposed to be the leader types who are more conventional and conscientious. Not in the least bit true. We looked at birth order across 380,000 people and found an average correlation of 0.02. And, and the findings that we got, even with that small of a correlation, didn't match any of the theories. So birth order doesn't tell you who you are. Socioeconomic status. A lot of people will argue that you know, what you say about yourself when you're 18 has got to be related to your background, your background most often being your family and, and their context, which is often defined concretely by what jobs your parents have, how much education they have, and that kind of environment should lead to certain qualities. So we do know, for example, that there's a pretty strong relationship between socioeconomic background and, and IQ. No such thing with personality. So the average correlation between your family's education and income levels is about 0 0.03, 0 0.04 on any given big five measure you might use. Your parents say that they're supportive or they're authoritarian or they're inconsistent. Those types of qualities in your parents have really small relationships to who you are in terms of your personality. And so, for example, we had a couple studies we just finished where the aggregate R squared for predicting something like conscientiousness was 2%, using everything birth order, socioeconomic status, parenting styles, peers, neighborhoods, you name it. And so we're kind of left with a mystery. Um, at least our initial efforts to try to figure out what the background factors are for who you are um, hasn't resulted in anything that's uh, significant isn't the right word. Um, there's no big signal there. There's no big one thing that we can find. We might not be looking in the right place. Um, there might be other variables that we should consider. But looking at the array of variables we have considered, they're the ones that you would typically think are going to be responsible for who you are. And so we have a mystery. And that's where we're at now. If you think about it, it also extends to another question, which is, can I change you or can I change myself? I'll get to that later. Um, but the, if I had asked the question from when do you change the most, it's, it's actually in adulthood. It's not, not earlier, which is really interesting because from my perspective, that isn't a message that's really um, gotten across to the developmental scientists because most developmental science focus on kids because the assumption is that that's when the most important development occurs. Well, if you think so, if you think about it just from a consistency perspective, like, um, and you can do it at an aggregate, the simplest way we do it is test retestability, which is as a population, do we all keep the same ranking? Are you more extroverted than I am when you're 20 and when we're 40 and we re meet? We may have both become more extroverted, but you're still higher than me, right? That would be perfect rank order stability um, with some mean level change. Um, there are a few recent studies that go to that question. So we published a big meta-analysis looking at uh, whether seeing a therapist results in personality trait change last year, and apparently it does. So at least across 200 studies, you see people who saw a therapist uh, increased in emotional stability to the tune of a half a standard deviation in a relatively short amount of time. Now, the therapies weren't designed to change personalities. They were there to treat people. They just happened to measure personality along with other things. And so that really doesn't ask and answer the question, if you want to change yourself, you know, can you do it? Uh, Nate Hudson, who is a graduate of our program in Champaign, has been pursuing that question. He's got some very provocative studies that are really cool where he's asking people, do you want to change? And most people say, yes, they do want to change their personality. And then he says, okay, let's try. And so set the goal to do so and give them tools to do so. And Nate has done several longitudinal studies where if you set the goal to change yourself and you work on it, um, there's some evidence that you actually do show small increases in whatever trait it is you're trying to change. 
there's some fun boomerang effects. So if you set the goal and you don't follow through, you get worse. <laughs> so it's not like a contrast effect. You buy that self-help book and it just sits on your shelf and it reminds you that you didn't actually do the things you needed to do. So at least at this point, I'd say the, the research has suggested that it's possible.